Welcome back. Now it's time to kick off our final session where our very own Collagic CEO, Bill Fathers, will chat with our very special guests, the Google Cloud speakers, Adam and Yan Bing. They'll continue to explore trends and innovation to accelerate cloud infrastructure and answer some of your questions. Bill, please take it away. Brilliant, Chris. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity. And first of all, uh, thank you to Yan Bing and Adam uh, for joining me today. Uh, and hopefully you all have an opportunity to listen to their really fantastic presentations earlier in the day, uh, both giving overviews of Google Cloud Platform uh, and, of course, where customers are really exploiting their artificial intelligence uh, capabilities as part of the Google Data Cloud. Now, we have an opportunity to ask two of the leading experts in the industry, frankly, uh, some additional questions and follow-up questions just to dig a little bit deeper into how enterprises are uh, taking advantage of this almost space age capability that Google Cloud represents. So first of all, uh, Yang Bing, Adam, welcome, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, um, Yang Bing, if I could just, if we could start with, with a question for you. Uh, in your presentation, you outline, you know, the staggering growth of Google Cloud really since inception and certainly over the last few years and talk about an eye-watering $750 billion you know, addressable market. Uh, it sort of suggests that we're in a whole new era of cloud adoption. Could you expand a bit further on how customers are embracing this new era of cloud adoption? Yeah, so Bill, thank you so much for having me at your our, uh, at your event, and it's so great to appear uh, with you uh, together virtually because our last time appearing together was on a big stage in person. So, uh, you know, so I spoke about the uh, the three stages of uh, the cloud journey from the VM stage to the infrastructure stage to now the transformation cloud, and I think uh, the with this evolution, uh, with the transformation cloud, we're really seeing the market open up. Uh, with many, many new uh, possibilities. So one of my role at Google Cloud, uh, I manage a lot of the platform capabilities uh, at Google Cloud, and one of them is our commerce platform. That is, you know, all the billing and monetization capability. So I get to see firsthand how customers are consuming our services. It's like the, the cash register ka every time when they use our uh, services. And on, uh, on the other hand, we also see incoming contracts as we, uh, you know, sign up with whether it's existing new customer for um, for a new commitment. So it's really exciting to see the growth on, on both ends. And so what's driving that uh, that growth behind the scene? Um, you know, we are looking at a few different dimensions. First of all, you know, how existing customers are growing their workload and usage and how we're gaining new customer. So that's one dimension. There's also another dimension is how you look at uh, digital native customers who are early adopters of cloud, you know, how they continue to, to, to evolve and expand, and also what's happening with enterprise customers. Uh, certainly other dimensions are industry verticals or, you know, uh, different uh, geos and, and market. And the good news is we're seeing uh, tremendous growth across all of these dimensions and, uh, and, and field. You know, take, uh, you know, existing customers, like huge customers like uh, Spotify, you know, they just, uh, uh, recommitted for the next few years and continue to expand their spend with us. You know, we have new customers, relatively new customers like Major League Baseball, you know, really trying to revolutionize uh, their um, uh, experience for both the players as well as the, the audience, whether you're in the stadium or, you know, uh, we're watching the game. So it's really exciting to see how that comes out. And we have certainly native, uh, digital native customers like, you know, uh, Twitter, you know, I talk about that in, in my portion, uh, really using our data cloud to drive their next generations of analytics and AI capability. And But we also have enterprise customers like HSBC, very large uh, bank, you know, uh, using us for their uh, digital transformation journey. So um, it's just, uh, you know, it's not just one thing that's happening, it's you see all these customers from different segment yeah. embracing transformation cloud. So that is what uh, make it really exciting. And certainly is that's the foundation for the phenomenal 
uh, revenue growth that we have seen. So thank you. So adoption is now basically across every industry vertical, every customer size. And you, you sounds like you're seeing both sort of long-standing, 100-year-old organizations making this change, as well as some people who are born in the cloud, the Spotify's, Twitter's of this world, who were there anyway. But it, it feels like, as you say, people are embracing next-gen apps and the, you know, things like Spanner, the sort of application services that are now available in the cloud, rather than just thinking about this as a way of moving their infrastructure, you know, bluntly into the cloud. Here's what I've already got, I'm going to move it in the cloud. So, I mean, Adam, I'd imagine customers listening to this must be thinking, you know, wow, there's one layer of benefits from just moving my infrastructure into the cloud, but if I could start using, you know, these incredible application services, even better. Any advice to them about how they might get to the promised land quicker? Because there's all this existing investment probably in systems that have been you know, there for ages. How do you suddenly get to this? From, what's the best way of getting there? Yeah, great question. Thanks for that. And I'll sort of pick up on uh, what you just heard from Yang Bing, which is you know, particularly these giant enterprises. Let's take uh, HSBC, um, who I'm sure still has mainframes. And you know, we just did, a, I think, a press release today where they're using our chatbots to uh, do a couple of different things. One, to maintain compliance, and the other is uh, to handle customer calls. And so it's really about thinking about the, the, the use case or the problem you want to solve uh, and solve most efficiently uh, with, with the cloud. Um, the, the, the other thing I would mention is... Um, there's this, this a whole process around um, educating internally so that you can really get your team um, ramped in terms of using the cloud. And so investing in training and investing in, in transforming uh, your organization. Um, and the, the thing that I've heard from talking to a lot of customers is, at least from the perspective I come from, Unleashing your data scientists is is really a significant um, advantage, and we've seen uh, whether it's a bank, uh, whether it's a, a carrier or a retailer, uh, giving your data scientists these tools so that they can uh, run their queries faster, they can experiment uh, more often and faster. Uh, really allows you to sort of understand what use cases are going to create the most value for the organization. Thank you. And I think we're sure we'll come back to that. I would imagine that is the crux of what most people want to know on this uh, on this session is, you know, we've, we've already got some of the benefits of cloud by getting our infrastructure more elastic, cheaper, better to run, easier run. But now how do I get my applications running there? Yeah, I'm being one of the other bits you stressed on the open cloud piece was around open source and the, the embrace of things like Kubernetes uh, as a framework that, you know, really can help differentiate Google in a number of different ways, um, not least of which is this sort of hybrid cloud, multi-cloud cloud world. Um, are there, it, it's, obviously it probably sounds easier than it is to actually implement, but of the use cases that are emerging around people that are starting to embrace, you know, the, the sort of uh, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud Kubernetes framework. Are there any particular customer use cases that are best suited to that model? Um, yes, so, so Bill, again, that's a, that's a great question. You know, when we think about uh, open cloud, certainly, you know, uh, build on open source is a key um, uh, attribute of that, but this is also embracing very different type of flexible uh, uh, environment and, and really offer our customer uh, the choice. And uh, Ansos as our uh, uh, you know, flagship product, you know, really embracing that open uh, cloud um, uh, and supporting modern application development in that environment. You know, we've been very keen on, uh, you know, on, on that, you know, making progress on that journey. Uh, we, uh, you know, when we launched uh, Ansos, we uh, make it very clear we want to support hybrid cloud, uh, multi-cloud. So, you know, Enzo supports a variety of uh, environments, you know, from uh, uh, certainly uh, the more um, cloud-native environment, you know, Google Cloud to uh, the 
on-prem environment that's like uh, VMR. And at the end of last year, we also launched uh, the new Ansel Spare Metal so that give customer even more choices if they do not want a, a VMR-based environment. You know, we've launched uh, Ansel support for on top of AWS. So the, really the whole notion is to liberate the application developer so that they get to uh, build once but run anywhere truly avoid that uh, uh, that uh, vendor uh, lock-in. And so uh, um, what we have seen often is, you know, customer wants to use this platform to help them modernize uh, their application uh, so that they can achieve, you know, whether it's a reduction in cost, uh, whether they want to reduce uh, security risk, uh, uh, whether they want very fast time to market, uh, you know, so that they can uh, develop their uh, their application quicker, or have a higher level, consistent uh, quality of service that comes with uh, with the platform. So there is definitely a lot of uh, benefit uh, to it, and we are seeing our customers adopting it in a, a variety of use cases uh, in different verticals uh, as they try to modernize uh, their their application. So application modernization is definitely the uh, the cornerstone of um, uh, of the NSOS approach. Thanks, Irene. Adam, I'm going to come to you in a second to talk a bit more about artificial intelligence, but if we could just just stay on Anthos for a second longer, just so I, I'm making sure I understand this. Um, I mean, it sounds like if you've got an enterprise that has some infrastructure, some applications running on bare metal, some running on VMs that they just don't want to move, even some that are running on AWS, and some running already in Google Cloud Compute World, all of them can live in the same environment from an Anthos perspective, i.e. you can run applications on top of them and you can use Google management tools to manage the applications, even if they're living on all of those different types of infrastructure. Is that, is that which presumably speeds up the way in which you can embrace this because you don't have to forklift everything. You can keep some things bare metal, you can keep some things VM while they transform. Is that kind of the framework? Um yeah, so so Phil, that's a that's a great question. I think the uh, you know Ansos does embrace a different type of environment, uh, but you know Ansos is fundamentally is an application modernization uh, yeah. platform. So it does uh, require it, us to um, you know modernize your your application from its you know original form. Yeah. And the good news is uh, we are building a lot of tools to make that uh, yeah. very easy. One of the uh, the key initiative we have is. You know VM onboarding to Ansos. You know how you modernize. You know traditional apps develop. Uh, you know in a in a uh, VM like environment. How you onboard that to Ansos. Yeah. So we're developing a lot of the tooling and automation uh, to help our customer accelerate that uh, that journey. And once you're on the Ansos platform, then you have that flexibility of choosing those different uh, platform. So this is a little bit different from. Uh, you know, other things we, we also have uh, from the uh, the Google portfolio, let's say if we want to uh, support a uh, hybrid cloud environment where uh, you want to have your VMR workload running on, on GCP, but you still want to run it in a VMR environment, you know, through our uh, acquisitions of Cloud Simple a couple of years ago and uh, our internal development, uh, we have a capability called Google VMR uh, Engine. Uh, you know, that give you that uh, VM uh, level compatibility so that you don't have to go through this this modernization journey. So so that's that's the uh, that's the dis distinction. Got it. And I would think for our audience uh, that I would I hope you're all scrabbling to read that section of the Google Cloud Compute website, because that obviously is a game changer of many things you're going to hear today. But that means you can effectively thought with you know, you, you, you'll get the point. That's very powerful. So Adam, artificial intelligence, um, you know, I keep waiting for the day that uh, the people that own CoLogix tap me on the shoulder and say, I've been replaced by an artificial intelligence engine. Can't be that hard, can it? <laughs> so that may not happen, but, but if, you're, if you're sitting there thinking, gosh, you know, how do I take advantage of incredibly space age stuff that you can get access to on, on Google Cloud? How does a small, medium sized company, you know, of any vertical, we're lucky to have customers on the call today of, of across the spectrum in Canada and the United States and other parts of the world. If you're th thinking we haven't got much going yet in this area, where do you recommend they get started so that that project demonstrates success that they can build it? 
Yeah. So, so thank you. Thank you for that. I think, um, and, and it can be daunting. Uh, that's, that's for certain. Um, the, the thing I would say is um, generally it starts with what type of industry you're in, but that said, um, we do have a product called AutoML, which makes it easy for anybody who's not a, you know, a machine learning scientist to basically uh, build their own models. Even, you know, even I can do it. And, and so leveraging our, our, uh, our AutoML uh, platform uh, for, you know, all of your data scientists to, to build their own models and predictions um, is the best, easiest way to get started. But that said, uh, you know, we're, we've also invested in solutions uh, that are sort of uh, appropriate for certain functions or certain industries. So we have a solution called uh, Call Center AI, uh, which maybe a lot of your uh, customers who might be carriers would be really interested in yeah. uh, that allow, you know, customers to, it's not just a regular chatbot, but what it really does is allows, allows you to handle complex conversations, mm -hmm. those hard building conversations, and then do root cause analysis using its in, insights in the background around uh, questions that continually come up. Um, if you are a, um, if you do a lot of procurement, uh, we have a product called uh, Procurement AI that allows you to, you know, use parses to extract data from all the all the documents that you've used for procurement uh, to do better analysis around how you can make improvements in what you're purchasing. And so we've got a variety of industry solutions, a, a healthcare API that allows you to um, bring all of your healthcare data together to do better uh, patient uh, analysis. And so there's there's a if you're depending on your industry there's industry solutions and then just generically um, auto ML makes it easy for for anybody to build machine learning models. Hopefully people are taking notes quickly. I mean I know we've got a number of healthcare customers on the call and procurement is a function that's common to all. I just love that idea of some engine absorbing all of your current contracts and optimizing them and identifying where you can drive improvement and value creation. That seems like a really logical. One thing we're, we're looking at, obviously nothing on the scale that obviously Google's able to do it, is optimizing the, the, the sort of energy efficiency of our data centers by trying to find a way of using Google Cloud to try and interrogate our building management systems to give them feedback to work out where we can tweak and tune our cooling and, uh, and, and air regeneration capabilities, which is- well, it, in so, so as you heard in my talk, uh, we've had you know massive improvements in uh, in our data centers, and I'm sure our account team would love to talk to you about that. Yeah, great. Yeah, um, brilliant. And obviously, um, we're not quite yet at planet scale, which I think is probably the scale at which Google's doing this, which is phenomenal. Great. Um, now, to that point, Yan Bing, we've got quite a few. Nice. We have over 600 uh, network. Uh, service providers, many of whom own vast swathes of the fiber optic infrastructure across North America. We have many managed service providers. We have carriers, internet exchanges. Uh, many of them today are carrying some of the traffic that flows between Google Cloud Platform and, and your clients, and perhaps even some of the traffic that flows in between the Google infrastructure itself. Uh, we, we're happy and I'm, I'm very lucky to be hosting a number of on-ramps as well across our North American footprint. So quite a lot of that traffic converges on our interconnection hubs. If you're sitting there as a carrier today, and obviously probably pleased to see the growth in cloud traffic that's occurred both on public and private networks, how else can carriers you know, help, help participate and become an increasing, increasingly relevant to the Google Cloud? And, and obviously, the jargon that's used a lot at the moment is talking about services being deployed to the edge, i.e. very close to the, the, the sort of center of gravity of the network. Any, any advice or guidance to carriers or service providers as to how they might keep evolving their product portfolio to stay relevant? Yeah, uh, Bill, that's a great question. You know, first of all, I want to thank uh, to, you know, uh, some of uh, your customers who are also, you know, our uh, customers and partners to, to, you know, continue to support our growth. I think the uh, you know, as we think about the um, the evolutions of uh, cloud and multi-cloud, you know, we talk about uh, public cloud, hybrid cloud, private cloud, but definitely the emerging trend here is going to be edge cloud, and another trend is going to be sovereignty cloud. 
I think both topics are extremely relevant to uh, to the carrier audience. Uh, and you know, the you know, with Edge Cloud uh, or with Edge everywhere, you know, it's not just one form of Edge. We also know that Edge is about you know many different type of edges. Whether you are a telco edge or a public cloud edge or a consumer edge, such as in you know. Uh, IoT devices were branch office. So there's many of these different flavors of edge, of, you know, that they carry a certain uh, common theme that is about bringing compute closer to where the use case, where the data is, so that to reduce that, you know, that latency, but that they also require a lot of different consideration and they are different use cases. And maybe let me give an examples of, uh, a couple of examples of what we're doing with uh, a Canadian uh, provider uh, how we help them digitally transform and, and do joint business together, and also a European uh, provider from a sovereignty angle. Mm -hmm. So uh, so this Canadian uh, provider is actually really a, uh, you know, a, a brand name uh, in, uh, in Canada. Uh, so this is uh, Chalice. We announced uh, together with them very recently that we're forming a 10-year uh, partnership is really to help bring digital transformation you know, to uh, their particular industry, including, you know, communication technology, you know, healthcare, uh, uh, agriculture. And the significance of this uh, type of partnership is, uh, it's fairly broad. It's, it's not like, oh, they offer one particular type of services and this is really fairly comprehensive. So uh, what we're trying to do is a few fold. You know, one is we want to help them uh, digitally transform themselves. You know, they, we are working with them to, uh, address technical debt in their data center and infrastructure and uh, uh, to help them achieve agility, cost saving, you know, all the good benefit that cloud bring. Uh, and we're also helping them with their uh, customer facing uh, touch points through actually Adam's portfolio on artificial intelligence. I believe they are a contact center, you know, they're very much interested in contact center AI, uh, you know, um, and we're also doing joint innovation work, especially for some of the edge related, uh, you know, uh, use cases, you know, for example, machine vision for retail, you know, how that can help uh, at the at the edge. And so, so really a multifaceted engagement that collaborate on infrastructure modernization, you know, application development modernization through ANSOS, you know, AI use cases, edge use cases, you know, edge is still reasonably early for us, you know, uh, and, and we are partnering with them a great deal. So, so this is a, you know, a great example of what are all the different possibilities uh, we can accomplish uh, through this partnership. Uh, another example I want to give is actually also another, you know, uh, very familiar brand to you, Bill. I know you and I both work with them very closely. This is, a, you know, the largest provider in Europe, OVH. Uh, again, you know, we also announced together uh, a very strategic uh, partnership. So what we're trying to do is to co-build, you know, trusted cloud solution in Europe. We know uh, Europe is, this is probably happening everywhere, you know, with the increased the geopolitical uh, tensions and data sovereignty concern. Um, a lot of, you know, our uh, regional customers are going to need regional sovereign cloud solutions. So this is something fairly new in the in the cloud world. And if you think about sovereignty, this really tie back to our open cloud uh, notion. You know, if you want to be, uh, you know, let's say if you want to build a closed cloud, you actually first need to be open because the way to build a closed cloud is to leverage open source. Because if you're leveraging proprietary uh, software, you, you don't have as much that sovereignty control. So, so we're looking at sovereignty in, you know, how we, make sure your data has sovereignty, that's data residence, how your operation has sovereignty, that means you know, your cloud is operating in a particular country or, uh, uh, or locale, uh, your software has sovereignty, meaning you have full transparency into what is software that's running your cloud workflow. Okay. So this type of uh, work is also pushing the boundary of the cloud and we're partnering uh, with um, a partner like OVH to really push the envelope of how to develop, you know, a hosted, managed, uh, ANSOS-like environment that can achieve a very high degrees of sovereignty. So, so you know, it's, it's a very uh, interesting uh, angle to, to look at this type of problems. 
So yeah, so a couple of examples, you know, certainly one, both comprehensive partnership, but one was a little bit of a edge flavor. This one was a the sovereignty stack that's built on top of Ansels. Right, and if, if I could just, because there's so much in that response to, to reflect on, and so just to help folk, you know, one answer might have been, yeah, you can resell our stuff. However, you're now hearing the answer is, it, there's huge opportunities for you as service providers to potentially start to offer uh, some of the key components of the fabric that's gonna make up the enterprise story. Um, and then that second point I thought was fascinating. So sovereignty, obviously we all understand that concept of France or Germany saying data is French and it stays in France, just choosing that as an example as a country. And therefore you would have thought physically you needed to make sure you know your, your infrastructure was constrained in perhaps Canada is another example. Your point was you need to use open source software so there's no risk that proprietary software stacks get perceived as being obstacles to, uh, to, to data clarity and, and transparency. That's super interesting. That you, it's the reverse of what you think. You've got to embrace open source to actually fully protect data uh, yeah. from a quality perspective. Yeah. You have to be open in order to achieve yeah. closeness. Or <laughs> that's, yeah. you know, it's, 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 it's very uh, yeah. uh, interesting. But I, I do think, you know, there is opportunity for us to do digital transformation together for you, for your customers. Yeah. You know, there's opportunity to uh, you know, uh, host uh, our solutions, you know, our comprehensive, uh, you know, portfolios of solutions yeah. so that you bring your unique uh, uh, value add. Uh, for example, we work with partners like Virtual Stream uh, to really leverage their competence in SAP. You know, this, uh, we definitely want to make sure we leverage our partner strengths. Uh, we can leverage you for some of these regional use cases because we have to rely on uh, people in France, in Germany, uh, rather than for us to be able to independently operate in every country. That's just uh, beyond any cloud player's ability. So so I, I think there are many different angles to, to partner be, besides the basic uh, reselling and services, et cetera. And well, brilliant. So, so I could literally ask you another hour of questions. This is fascinating. Sadly, we only have a little bit of time left. So I'm going to sneak in a slightly cheeky question at the end, which is, you, sh you showed what the world could look like in five years' time. And obviously, a, you know, your backlog has grown 33 billion over the last short period. What does the world look like in five years' time in Google? What does it even look like? Uh, Adam, do you want to have a crack at it? Where, where are we in five years' time? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, from, from our, the AI perspective, you know, I, we think, I think about it in, in two ways. One of which is um, auto ML or autonomous AI is everywhere. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, the, the car making a last minute uh, sort of correction to avoid a crash. But also AI is assistive. And what I mean by that, it's, it's empathetic. It is providing you helpful suggestions. And that is everywhere. So you'll have auto AI, autonomous AI, and assistive AI everywhere in five years. Wow. Yeah, Bing. Um, I, I I have a few uh, uh, you know wish wish list, a few on my wish list. You know, I definitely uh, I'm going to look forward to see you know new cloud native di disruptors. You know, continue to leverage cloud to do amazing things and disrupt whatever industry you know they are set to disrupt. Uh, I'm also excited to see large uh, enterprise reaching that tipping point, meaning. They're going to be using cloud as you know a bigger part of their um, their infrastructure and their footprint to to yeah. So so today you know we certainly know we're still on the other side of cloud adoption for enterprise. I'm going to be looking forward to edge computing really play out. Yeah. Uh, you know with 5G and uh, you know all the the perfect storm of cloud technology and 5G and uh, consumers and use cases, you know, we have this perfect storm of really driving uh, and landing edge computing. Uh, I like to see open cloud become the foundation of the trusted cloud, because yeah. I do think the world, uh, you know, for good reason or bad reason, is going to look a little bit more segmented from a cloud point of view. And, and you need an open cloud approach to build that 
levels of trust and security in this new cloud world paradigm. So, so those are the few things I'm betting on. Well, Yanbing, Adam, thank you both so much indeed. Wow, folks, I know people will be replaying this interview uh, a, a few times to make sure that they get every scrap of value. You've both been fantastic. Thanks for uh, your presentations earlier and for answering our questions. And thanks for your business uh, as ever. And it's been great partnering with you. And I hope we get the opportunity to do this again sometime. Thanks so much indeed, guys. Great. Well, that's it, folks. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending this session. We wish we were in person with you be in Columbus Zoo or in Vancouver uh, or, or in Montreal uh, or, or Dallas or any one of our nine markets today. Uh, but this has been great. And thanks so much. We know hundreds and thousands of you have attended the session, which we may not have been able to do in person. Um, so that, that's been a blessing. And uh, please let us have your feedback on the sessions here. Uh, personally, I think this is some of the best content and some of the most interesting perspectives I've heard for a long, long time. Uh, but for that, thanks to everybody that's organized today's event, for all of our presenters, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in person at some point here in the future. Thanks, everybody, and I wish you a great rest of your day.